We have one final trailblazer to hear from tonight. Fresh off of an exclusive with BTS and, and, and President Moon Jae-in of South Korea, Juju Chang, the Emmy Award-winning journalist and co-anchor of ABC News' Nightline, is here with us tonight to tell us her Korean-American story. I just want to add that in a lot of ways, the circle is coming fully round with this Trailblazer Award being given to Juju tonight because it was about seven years ago that she had asked me to fill in for her for a particular fundraiser, and it happened to be none other than Korean American Story. So if it wasn't for her, I literally would not be here. She was to go on assignment suddenly. She asked if I could fill in, and I remember taking just one hot second to decide whether I wanted to play second fiddle to the Juju Chang. <laughs> the rest is self-explained. Juju has decades of experience in television journalism, reporting regularly for Good Morning America, anchoring the news on Good Morning America at one point, and also filing for 2020 on ABC. It all came to bear in a personally and professionally defining series of reports about the rise in bias and hate crimes against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community this year. She co-anchored an ABC News Live special, Stop the Hate, the Rise in Violence Against Asian Americans. And after the mass shooting at three spas in Atlanta, Chang co-chaired, co-anchored rather, and reported from the scene for an ABC News 2020 breaking news special called Murder in Atlanta. You don't get to be the face of network news coverage without the ability to finesse in-depth personal narratives with pressing national and international news. From the COVID-19 pandemic, to natural disasters, to terrorism and racial equity, her long-form storytelling includes a critical examination of the controversial Remain in Mexico immigration policy, an award-winning report, Trans and Targeted, on violence against transgender women of color across the country, the murder of Matthew Shepard, which garnered Juju a GLAAD award, and the mass shootings at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, the concert in Las Vegas, and of course at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown. The entry-level desk assistant who started at ABC News in 1987 has been recognized with multiple Emmys, Gracies, a DuPont, a Murrow, and Peabody Awards for her work. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a founding board member of the Korean American Community Foundation here in New York. Everyone, please welcome a woman who makes a living telling stories, trailblazer Juju Chang. Okay, tonight I'm playing second fiddle to Vivian Lee. And I'm glad to do so, honored to do so. And Eugenia, <laughs> Toki Monster Ya, where are you? You guys did an excellent job, and I'm really sort of humbled to. I, be, I feel like I bring your cool factor down. <laughs> so I'm grateful to be honored among you. Um, you know, it's true, I've spent 30 years telling other people's stories. Um, and I appreciate the power of storytelling, which is why I appreciate your leadership. I appreciate this organization, I appreciate the mission, I appreciate what you do year in and year out, HJ. And so I'm honored and pleased to be here and I'm humbled to share a little bit of my story with you tonight. So I was born in Seoul in 1965. Good skin care, thank you. <laughs> it was roughly a decade after the armistice between North and South Korea to end the war, right? I remember wearing my favorite red dress on a plane ride from my birthplace to America. I was four years old. Somewhere between Hawaii and San Francisco, I got airsick all over my favorite red dress. It's a good thing I don't believe in omens. I grew up in Sunnyvale, California, 
decades before it morphed into Silicon Valley, the mecca of Asian and Asian American techies, right? I grew up at a time when there weren't that many people who looked like me. I felt other, as we've started calling it. My parents talked funny. My family's food smelled funny. Uh, my face looked funny, as I was reminded on the playground. I remember my blood boiling when kids would call me pie face or flat nose. I spent a number of nights going to sleep with scotch tape on my nose trying to fix that problem. <laughs> Didn't really work. My parents were so proud to be Korean, and they taught me to be fiercely proud to be Korean, but there were many days when I was simply embarrassed to be different. Despite their college degrees and social standing in Korea, here in the United States, my parents were classic, hardworking, working-class immigrants who came over in the 1965 Immigration Act. Amma ran a flower shop. Appa labored at an ice cream store. Together, they ran a small hotel. We kids, there were five of us, four daughters, and finally the boy. So they had five. I remember like changing linens and bringing toilet paper, and to this day I can fix a toilet because we spent so much time helping around the motel. But I remember watching people talk down to my dad. I remember seeing the sting of, of him being emasculated because he had a heavy Korean accent, that perpetual foreigner mythology that lives to this day for people who look like us. I also grew up uh, with family stories about the Korean War, and, and the most compelling story to me was one that involved my maternal harmony. They were wealthy enough to get a truck to escape from Seoul to Busan. And as the North Korean troops advanced, my grandmother realized they didn't have enough seats for all seven of the children in the truck. And some were grown at that point, and some were young. But as insurance, my harmony took the family's precious jewels and the gold and the valuables and stitched it into a large piece of fabric and wrapped it around each child's midsection so that in the event they were separated during the exodus, they could be armed with what they needed to make their way in the world. As a mother of three boys, 20, 17, 13, I've often thought about what it must have been like for them to flee their homes and fear for their children's future, for their very survival. I think my parents tried to arm us with what they thought we needed to make our way in the world. They gave each of us their most precious gems, pride in their Korean heritage, their work ethic. They told us and they showed us every day, by example, that the key to life involved hard work and life begins and ends with family. These core values were stitched into the fabric of our childhoods, wrapped tightly around us to help us make our way in the world. My dad was a bit of a maverick though, even though I grew up watching him subjected to what today we would call microaggressions or outright racism. He in turn reflected Korean xenophobia he had, let's say, some racially insensitive views of other people. <laughs> oh, Abba, don't say those kinds of things. <laughs> and during this past year's anti-Asian hate, so much of which Vivian described that I covered, you know, Vilma Carey being beaten in front of the Midtown High Rise, um, the Atlanta spa murders, I, I, you know, on the scene, um, one of the sidebar discussions that we kept having as Korean Americans in the panels and the discussions that we kept having was the need for us to confront our own racism before we can heal others. When I was graduating from college from Stanford University in California, I was a California girl, right? It's true. Like, oh my God, I didn't want to be Korean. But... Later, I embraced my Koreanness so vigorously because of the way that I was raised. But my dad, again, back to the xenophobia, when I was moving to New York, he made sure to warn me about the Jews in New York. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it tracked along the lines of the anti-Semitic tropes that you could imagine 
um, scapegoat Jews around the world, the same kind of scapegoating that happened with Asian Americans in the past year with the pandemic, when, when fear and un uncertainty is weaponized against a group. So when I moved to New York in 1987, and within six months fell in love with a guy named Neil Shapiro, I knew I was in a bit of trouble. Kind of sweet Romeo and Juliet trouble, except they both wound up dead, so maybe not so sweet. When we made the big step to move in together, we, we made sure to get two landlines, so that if my parents called the 873 number, I knew I could pick up. This was clearly in the days before caller ID, okay? <laughs> I kept Neil's last name obscured from my dad. He had had heart bypass surgery at that point and he was really frail, uh, frail and we weren't sure exactly what would happen if he found out that he might have a Jewish future son-in-law. We, we thought it might kill him, actually. So when we got married in New York, my mom came, but my dad stayed home, oblivious. It sounds so cruel now, I know it, and I'm vaguely ashamed of it, but only vaguely, because trust me, it was for the best. <laughs> a year later, we decided to have a second fake wedding in California for all of my dad's Korean friends, because he had a lot of Korean friends in the Korean community. He was a big knocker, as the Jews say, in the Korean-American community. He'd always been involved in the Korean Chamber of Commerce. It's part of why I get so involved in Korean-American organizations. That comes straight from my dad. My sisters and mom planned this fake wedding in California. It was, I'll never forget, at the Fairmont in San Jose. The wedding planner thought it was the most bizarre wedding planning. Where's the bride, he'd say. Like, they'd say, oh, she doesn't need to be here, it's okay. We have to pick a cake and entrees and hors d'oeuvres. And they were like, ah, she doesn't care, it's okay. What we didn't expect, though, that was that my dad and all of his friends wanted to write checks for the bride and the groom. What was the groom's last name? I mean, literally, I was living an I Love Lu Lucy episode. So we used his middle name, Neil Barry. That's what we told everybody his name was. Ironically, Neil's own mother, Mildred, named him Neil Barry Shapiro with this exact scenario in mind. Okay, maybe not this exact scenario, but a scenario in which if he had ever encountered explicit anti-Semitism, he could truthfully say with a straight face, my name is Neil Barry. <laughs> and skip the Shapiro, which is precisely what it did. Turns out Neil's mom was prescient. Of course, you know how the story ends. Over time, my father grew to love Neil like a son, we never really discussed the whole Jewish thing, but he fully knew <laughs> that his son-in-law and his three strapping grandsons and eventually his beloved daughter are Jews. Yes, I converted. I am what they call a Jew by choice. Thank you. I never changed my name, though, to Shapiro, because people joked it would be like, Jew, Jew, Jew. I mean, like, not good. <laughs> but that's not the first time I've used that line, Eugene. I'll just have you know. Um, but of our three sons, I will say, <laughs> Jared, our oldest, you know, he's the least pigmented person I know, and he wanted to join the men of color club at his high school because that's how he identifies, is as an Asian American man of color. But he also fiercely identifies as Jewish American as well. And that is the gift that we pass on to him. And I think that brings us full circle, doesn't it? Like my Halmini in the war and my own Omani, Neil and I, as parents, have carefully stitched our most precious gems into the fabric of our children's lives. We've tried to give our sons these pearls of wisdom, our work ethic, our values of humility, of community, of integrity, and of course, pride in who they are and where they came from, both from the Confucian side and the rabbinical side. The joke at our real wedding was that Jews are the chosen people and Koreans are the chosen people. 
But during, but during the racial reckoning in the United States, so many people believe that in order to heal the mistrust and the racism within us, that's what we need to do before we can heal the racism amongst us. And so I stand here proudly saying that my ancestors, I'm sure, would look down on me, Eugene, and think that I have become their wildest dreams. I think that we, as, as descendants of those proud Koreans, uh, have a, as our duty to pass down the pride and the cultural heritage. These, in turn, are the gems that we pass on to our children as they make their way in the world. Thank you so much.